do it. Salt. There he is. Bird up. Hello. Fuck movies. Game over, man. Game over. Do a flip. What? You know, the undead. Ghouls. Like a pool. You are tuning in to Big Brain Podcast uh, with Kirby and Rudy. I'm Rudy. I'm Kirby. Uh, we're going to talk about Midsummer, which we saw a few days ago. Uh, we were originally going to do it fresh, but this is the our schedules aligned for today. <laughs> so, um, so initially, we're going to just talk about our thoughts about it, then our feelings, and then that's going to maintain spoiler free uh, in case whoever's listening hasn't seen it yet, and then we'll get into more spoiler territory. Um, so, Kirby, initial thoughts on The Midsummer? I liked it. Great. <laughs> That's it. Bye, guys. Bye. <laughs> uh, um, no, but um, once again, I think the director – God, I, now, I've, now I'm forgetting his name. Ari Aster. Yeah. Um, just just knows how to make an entertaining horror movie. I agree. Um, he used cinematography and, and the environment definitely to his advantage. Um, everything was – we talked about that, that the production value was really, really well. <laughs> it, was, it was good. Yeah, it, it seemed like he was able to work with a larger budget than uh, he – was with hereditary yeah um especially with like i guess the scale yeah of the movies. sets were amazing and well placed as well you got a sense of where everything was yeah as well um you were never lost really whenever we had a shot of a building you knew exactly what building it was and yeah we, each each um this is now an architecture podcast. It is. Each, <laughs> each, each, um, each building had a unique design to it. So just cutting to one shot of a building, you uh, remember exactly what that was for. Yeah. And, and come to think of it, he has a kind of knack with that because in Hereditary, we, we knew the house fairly well because the first shot was a miniature of it. So I thought – and, and – yeah. I love when I love when the setting itself kind of becomes a character. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Each each building had its own kind of feel to it. Um and things tied to it. <laughs> but uh so thoughts were good afterward. Yeah. yeah. Um I will say though the first time I saw Hereditary, I Felt the urge to immediately go rewatch it just because I felt like I had missed things, um, like little details that I wanted to like rewatch to see how much groundwork for events that took pla place later in the plot would uh, come to play. But yeah. this movie definitely felt more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I in a in a good way. You already know my feelings on that. I did not want to watch it again. Not because it wasn't a good movie. It was fantastic. But it, it – well, I guess we'll delve more into the feelings now. But I, I was completely disturbed after Hereditary and Midsummer. I'm genuinely surprised that you actually went to go see this movie, especially <laughs> after – how many times you've said I will never ever rewatch Hereditary, not because it's a bad movie, but because how um, disturbed it left you. I'm a, a little more desensitized. Well, no, the, what the problem was that I'm. I, I wouldn't say I'm not desensitized to that because I, I delve into horror myself, but and I, I write my own horror too. But no, there's something about the way he – it's more about the people that he writes about and the people that are portrayed. That is the disturbing part of it Yeah. because – and even the, the things that they do is so – is too real to me that 
like that, that people can actually do that and it's not portrayed in an unrealistic way like in saw or something that's oh that couldn't that couldn't happen he seems to have a lot more respect for his characters yeah um this is actually a perfect segue because i think we should definitely talk about the characters okay um i think he generally tends uh, the director tends to have more respect for his characters than your average horror movie director where they're just kind of like fodder yeah. and um i will say midsummer kind of dips its toe into like canon fodder characters a little bit but their motivations generally for the most part are solid they they fit within their own character the the decisions they make never betray their character um, but I think we've talked previously and said that the characters kind of yeah. walking out of the movie was that I kind of wish that there was a little more depth to mm-hmm. a lot of the characters. Sure. I, but like we said previously, there was a, a lot more characters in this movie than in Hereditary. And in Hereditary, they're very well um, – they were established very well and their arcs were very distinctive. But in this movie, I think the, the, its weakest point is the one dimensional characters that it has. They all do things within their character, but they aren't exactly complex. For the exception being the main character though. Yeah. Um, I, I think we've, we agreed that yeah. she, she freaking killed it. Exactly. That actress did a magnificent job playing her in all her uh, ups and downs of that character. She... I should I should grab a laptop so I can actually <laughs> <laughs> remember names People's and stuff names. like that. People's names? Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, do you want to pause? We can cut this out. Nah, let's leave it in. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway. Um, okay, so we haven't gone to spoilers yet, so let's talk about the more, like, cinematography stuff. We talked about how uh, it used lighting uh, for its storytelling a little bit, and Hereditary was very dark, but Midsummer, everything happens, nearly everything happens in the daylight. Yeah, most of the the scary things happen in daylight, yeah. and I think a movie that can accomplish that is... Um... Is doing something right. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> also, uh, the director. Oh my gosh. Or I mean, I guess the director of photography, um, in both Hereditary and this movie, amazing use of natural light. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the times in Hereditary, and definitely during the beginning of this movie, a lot of the times you're straining to see things, and that may that may sound. <laughs> like a criticism like everything's visible but it feels like how a dark room actually is like it's not this like yeah. blue filter like uh day for night mm-hmm. shooting that you would see on like the walking dead or there's like an obvious like floodlight somewhere in the background that's perfectly highlighting everything that needs to be seen it reminds me of like I don't know. It kind of reminds me of like the original, like Evil Dead, where like yeah, they're using like artificial lighting, but like the dark parts of that are like really freaking dark. Yeah, but that was more probably a technical limitation. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, also we've talked about how like there's this one scene where it's flooded with light. And, oh yeah, and yeah, I yeah. liked it because it was a more kind of it gave it a more like divine quality, and it fit with what was happening. Um, yeah, so it, which is, we'll get to that. We'll 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 get to that later on, <laughs> but, on which specific scenes. Yeah, but we're um, talking about. But yeah, it's it's it, there's a scene that is like very overexposed, but it kind of gives everybody this kind of um this glowing like angelic exactly um highlight um and especially in the context of the scene it it fits perfectly and it uh let's just say beachside cliffs are (laughs) forever ruined for me yeah um but 
that's as, that's as much as cinematography I want to talk about. Um, did you have any other points with that? I mean, I'd honestly have to rewatch it to yeah. point out specific scenes, but um, I don't know. I really enjoyed, and this delves into editing as well, but mm-hmm. I really enjoyed the the editing in the introduction. Yeah. Um, the way the shots kind of start out wide and then they bring yeah. us into the house and mixed with the the music the yeah. the single um the like music chanting like well. folk song yeah the, yeah that i was kind of trying to segue into yeah. <laughs> into like music and sound design um music was great it wasn't as um it wasn't as stand out as hereditary like like the music of hereditary like there's certain like musical parts in that that like I can remember vividly Mm -hmm. um what stood out to me very much was like the sound design and the use of silence like silence like it it, it's not like your like uh Blumhouse production where like silence like starts happening and then it's like ooh something's about to pop out it's like no silence is there to like that's the scary to not part. distract you and to like hold your head, hold your face towards the screen and say like, look at it, look at yeah. this horrible thing we're showing you. A lot of times, the, the silence is what makes the scene scary. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he and we talked about this how the he has somehow the director has somehow made just someone standing and smiling terrifying. Yes, <laughs> yes, Some, something. Uh, he he's very good at. Um, it's kind of that like uncanny valley, yeah. like, like someone is like not doing anything overtly threatening, but their motives are ambiguous. Exactly. It's that so, ambiguity, um, that you really don't, their brain has no idea what to think about it. Yeah. So it automatically goes to panic. Um, um, go ahead. I was going to say another sound design tech like trick i guess they used is the is like the shifting of focus like there's a lot of Mm -hmm. there's a couple scenes where the audio is kind of um distorted or like kind of muted but then it will like kind of shift into focus as the character is focusing into it which is yeah helps us not only fall like follow in the characters like like footsteps like imagine ourselves in their position but also that's like how like attention span works and he kind of uses that effect kind of how like a camera lens would like focus in on a subject Mm -hmm. um last thing before we get into spoiler talk uh it's well this is a little bit spoiler (laughs) this is but um it's more you want to wait no i i I think we're finished with non-spoiler talk do you I wanted to get more into mental illness. Oh, I thought we were still talking about technics or technic, uh, technical, technical like aspects. Uh, I didn't have any more. Okay, well, if it comes up, we'll uh, okay, we'll mention it. But right, right now, spoilers from here on out. Sure, you've um, been warned. <laughs> so the movie has a very good grip on what mental illness looks like. Uh, the main character obviously suffers through some depression, uh, and it's obviously seen throughout her family as well, her sister being bipolar, um, and then taking her parents out with her suicide attempt, or her successful suicide attempt. Um, so it portrays it very realistically. She has panic attacks throughout the movie. Um, she wants to be okay but she obviously isn't um she wants to like return she wants to do like normal things exactly she wants to like she wants to escape from her severe depression and anxiety through her relationship with christian Mm -hmm. um and obviously wants to feel included in his friend group but as we quickly learn after being introduced to Christian that his friends are assholes are not (laughs) a fan of her. Uh, Um, yeah. And even, I think most of her panic, panic attacks though, there is one that is, uh, induced by 
a severely stressful moment the two old people jumping off the cliff. Uh, the I was going to say, like, we're in spoiler territory, exactly. so you can just... Exactly. You can just say what happens when. The others are induced by drugs. And I thought that was interesting because that is also more a more realistic take on what happens when you're high. They're not seeing... Well, specifically, specifically psychedelics. Like, exactly. I loved... Um, I loved how they avoided the traditional movie television, yeah. like flashy lights and and sitar music mm-hmm. that plays when people do shrooms and stuff yeah. like that. But it was very. Um, it was more kind of like. I wonder if the director has done shrooms. Oh, I'm so positive he did, <laughs> because the way that the world moved around her while she was um, high. It, it seems very. He, that's I think I think that's probably what he experienced, maybe, or someone experienced in in the production. Because what <laughs> we are not advocating drug use. No, I've never done psychedelics. I've never done psychedelics either. <laughs> Even though I probably wouldn't need to, but but I have walked in on past roommates who are in the process of doing <laughs> acid, and what they describe to me is kind of what I imagined yeah. was portrayed in the movie. Yeah. But back to her mental state, um, one thing I know that is that you shouldn't trip if you ha- if you have a negative mental state because yeah, it doesn't yeah. end up tripping. But anyway, um, but yeah, she her her panic attack attacks are induced by that, and I thought that was very a nice touch, kind of weird thing to say in that respect. But very yeah, the way that she tried to like get out of the situation. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. I just thought that if as at at least there was one character that they decided to like, exactly put the most depth into. And that was our protagonist. Um, I mean, there's a lot of like little details that happen in the movie that kind of make her feel more grounded in reality. Um, I told you before about the, interaction she had with Christian where she mm-hmm. was upset with him that he kind of forgot to mention that he's going to Sweden with all of his friends in like two weeks. Yeah. And she's obviously upset at him for good reason, but they kind of start this argument and then he is almost going to storm out of the room. Like I, I should just go basically. And then she like pulls him back in and says like, no, like, stay yeah like yeah i'm sorry for bringing it up and like that is there are people like that yeah who, and she will who will shift the blame to themselves to yeah. keep their that relationship intact who because will she's, like push and pull exactly because she's so insecure in every way that her only relationship i think at the moment right because she only has one other friend is that that they talk about yeah, there was like someone else she called in the beginning. Yeah, but... so she only has a few human relationships, and she wants to salvage as many of those as possible because she really lost her family. Yeah, so... and you, you get the indication that like both Christian and what? I don't remember her name. <laughs> God damn it. We look like fucking Danny. amateurs. Danny. Danny. Uh, yeah, we, we get the implication that Danny and Christian are both not happy with the relationship, but are just kind of maintaining it out of like, because it's easier to do that than to, yeah than to, well, than to lose each other. Yeah, he. I get. I get the feeling that he is more out of pity. Yeah, that he stays with her. Yeah. Um, okay, let's move into actual Sweden. They're in Sweden now. Okay. Yeah. So uh, hard cut Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> so um, as as Pele, the the Swedish friend, um, he is the the recruiter. Basically, he brings them. He brings sacrifices to the village. Um, we never actually hate him for that, <laughs> which I thought was a kind of weird touch that I never, I never trusted him from the beginning because, no. because like once, once I learned, oh, they're going to Sweden yeah. and he's the Swedish one. Exactly. I'm like, oh, okay. he's like, the, he's the I, one. I think, I think we both 
yeah. came to that conclusion very early yeah. on that he, okay he's the the one bringing them exactly. to the the he's the harbinger of death but he never but, yeah was never mean he he was never mean he was never um outright a bad person or a bad guy he was just doing what what his religion demands you know like yeah. he, he was doing what he needs to do and um and none of the villagers actually came off as mean or suspicious or, or um, sinister in any way. Uh, obviously, they do sinister things, but when they do that, they're they're wearing masks as well. So they they're even t- even their faces are replaced with something else. So we're not we don't even associate the negative things with them. Um, yeah, I never I never thought of it like that. Um, that's interesting, but, but on the other hand, the main characters you despise. <laughs> I mean, I never, I, I didn't, I didn't hate the characters. I mean, I, there was like, there were certain, like, there was like a point where the character did something that kind of like turned my opinion of them, which I think was the intent. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm I'm generally against like cheaply making the characters hateable just so that you're less guilty or it feels more cathartic when horror movie things happen to them. But but I don't think the movie ex- actually exactly did that. We still you didn't like them as people, but the stuff that happens to them is not deserved. <laughs> it, it, the, yeah, the, it was there a explicit like kick the dog moment that you can think of i mean the only portion i can think about that was kind of like that was when christian christian basically double crosses all his friends (laughs) and oh when he completely disowns them he's like we are not associated with him whatsoever like anything that happens to him don't even like consider us because we were not involved with his shenanigans and that was a very very like i guess um shitty thing to do <laughs> i guess because well he was already at odds with oh yeah josh by that yeah. point um i said that's the only thing that remotely resembles like a kicking the dog moment but aside from that i don't think we ever were given something to latch on to explicitly hate the characters just dislike them um be, except the main character she you you sympathize – well, I, I would hope you sympathize with her um, throughout the whole movie, even to the end. I guess the only thing is that – and I, I mean I can't entirely blame the character, but like I guess the only thing she really did wrong was like stick with Christian and not see – like the signs that he well, really wasn't she that into was mentally it. unstable so I for, I can forgive her yeah for exactly <laughs> exactly um I was gonna say that I feel like next in the friends list that I feel like didn't really do all that wrong was like Josh yeah Josh I think was the more well actually no I actually disagree with that because I think jo- Josh so there's a part in the movie where basically kicks off all the disturbing things where two old people, um, they're at the end of their lives. They're explained that the winter of their lives. Um, and they conclude this by jumping off a cliff to their death. <laughs> and then if one of them doesn't die in that fall, they're smashed with a hammer, uh, Yzma style. So, um, <laughs> Uh, so I don't see the problem. Yeah. This was known by Josh. He knew about this tradition of theirs. Well, it was very heavily implied. It was implied that he had an idea of what was going to happen. He was not faced. But they never, they, I don't know. He was, he was, I think, cause there was, because there was the lineup, there was the lineup of characters and I'm pretty sure all of them had a shocked look on their face. Obviously some more than others, but it's implied that he had an idea of what the end of life ritual was going to be. Yeah. And that Exhibit A, when Danny asks him what the next day entails, and she said asks, is it scary? He just gives her like the most assholey smirk 
ever. <laughs> did he did she explicitly say is it gonna be scary? Yes, she explicitly okay. asked that and he this gives her like a smirk. Like, I, I trust <laughs> you, your uh your memory is better than mine. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, so he knew fairly well what was gonna happen and he decided not to I get Pele not telling them because the whole point is to get them there. Yeah. But to keep them there. Exactly. Too. But him not telling them that is a really dark thing to do. Especially especially considering that he must have known about, she, he about, of course about her knew. family. Oh yeah, he told they all knew about her family and the terrible things she's gone through. And they're like, oh yeah, let her come and see their terrible death rituals. Um Well then maybe like maybe Mark? Because, like, he didn't do anything, like, outright malicious. He was just kind of in, like, he was kind of a general jerk throughout most yeah. of the movie. The, I, only, the only thing that he did that kind of, like, was the, the like, his, his mistake was peeing on the ceremonial tree where they bury all of the <laughs> ancestors. ancestors. But, I mean, it, he was just, he was just not... Uh, paying attention to anything and well from the first I, it makes sense that the character would miss something like that i think his mistake was like not apologizing but i think it's totally within his character to oh, be of like course. Of course. Wh what I, I didn't know i didn't know yeah um, um but no from the beginning of the movie he's established as an unlikable person because he is edging christian on to just dump her and have sex with swedish girls when they go to sweden so like he is from the get-go an unlikable person which i despise as soon as the as soon as I saw him, but um, but honestly, that is but, solidified but when I, wait, wait wait wait, but that's solidified as you said when he pees on the ceremonial ancestral tree and does not apologize whatsoever. <laughs> but when he's egging him on to break up with her, this was before her parents died. Okay, and <laughs> like he talks about her like she's a dog. That he needs to get rid of. He does not. He he's completely um, misogynistic, and uh, he he's just a he's just a bad person. I, I did not like him whatsoever. <laughs> okay, you're gonna break out the M word. Yes, <laughs> I think it's it's deserved in this context. Okay. Um. Well, and then now I guess finally this segues into Christian, who I think by the end of the movie, most people would agree is the least likable. Yeah. But... I, I, I was, I was like. I still I didn't was, like his end though. <laughs> I was hoping, I was desperately hoping that there would be kind of more to his character, that he, that there was some part of him that like. No, I think was, I just was think... more redeemable, but like, yeah, like by the How's my... come on dude sorry <laughs> um this is a per this is a professional production man anyway i i was hoping that there would be more redeemable aspects to him but yeah like again and again he just makes the worst decisions and yeah it it's i i think someone could argue that like it's it's he he does those things because by the end of the movie he becomes the basically vessel of all of the all of the people's sins to be burned away which hmm. is fitting and somewhat yeah. poetic but i could see people arguing that like that character was just so like shafted. <laughs> well, I think. Well, first off, I mean, off, from like as as far as like the author goes in in like handling him. Oh sure, no, but 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 as far okay, so he has several moments. I think he has more things on his plate than just asshole because his relationship with Danny, I think, was just completely riding on pity. So already has no real no in, really no interest with her at that point. Um, I mean, I'm not going to put the blame on Danny at all, yeah. but she was kind of the only driving force of that relationship. If it wasn't if it, if it was up to him, it would be it, it would have ended already. Yeah. So he's kind of stuck in this relationship. He has no emotion for it. Uh, then his next thing that he wants to do is thesis. There he is a procrastinator. He, yeah. <laughs> um, he doesn't know what he wants to do. And he kind of just, Hey, I'm here. 
let me just do it on this and collaborate with Josh. <laughs> so he's so apathetic with his relationship and a procrastinator with his education. And then when it gets to the point where he it gets high and seduced to have sex with that Swedish girl, he's high <laughs> and highly influenced and um uh was persuadable persuadable yeah um and he kind of has like this thing looming over him with the elder people kind of like hey she she has an eye on you like you're yeah. you're you're her choice for mating you know and like yeah that was a love potion so he well, okay yeah, yeah i wanted to wait, but, okay okay but wait before finish we your get thought, to the, yeah. finish your thought and then i want to talk about the love potion yeah um, okay and, so and supernatural Okay, elements. okay. So he has this kind of um, weight on him by the community elders, this girl who's after him. He's already apathetic about his relationship, so he already has no emotional stake in that. And then he's influenced by psychedelic drugs. Uh, I think it's a perfect situation for him to fall and do what he did. And then, of course, they're going to lump all – the community is going to lump all their sins onto him because he's outwardly the most un, unredeemable of them all. Well, I, I don't think I I don't know. It's hard to say if the community chose, chose him. him because they well, knew he was the biggest. We'll get to that. I think it's more of a poetic coincidence. Well, we'll, we'll get to to their meddling. Um, you want to okay? You want to talk about their. I want to talk about, like, okay, because you mentioned the love potion. Yes. And people who have seen the movie will know what we're talking about. <laughs> um, but basically, early on in the movie, we're shown this tapestry, yeah. I guess, yeah. that kind of weaves the story of how th they make love potions in this community. Well, more how the girls kind of basically lure foreign men to be their their was it implied was it implied that it was a foreigner in the tapestry i mean why would you have to make one of the community people high to mate with you i guess <laughs> yeah you're right but anyway so it on one level it this girl uses makes a love potion for christian and i and like you could say, oh, the love potion worked, but like you said, there was a lot of stuff already in in play that kind of made it inevitable that yeah. he would do something like this. And there was other forces besides this supposed love potion that would have pushed him to do that. But I really appreciated that this movie didn't take a supernatural route. I think it helps distinguish it from hereditary and it yeah. also i think you said that it makes it more disturbing yeah that, exactly. the fact that it's all grounded in reality and there's no suspension of disbelief or no thing you can um just like kind of wave off as like oh that's just ghosts or something like exactly. that it kind of makes all of the horror way more grounded and it makes it way more it, it makes it too real <laughs> that again i would never see this movie again um but because it just made me feel awful at the end but not in a bad way it did its job it disturbed me very well <laughs> and um i give it an a plus for doing that but yeah uh that that was part of the reason it, it had no real supernatural elements it had very spiritual elements of course but um, none of it was was outwardly um, supernatural or uh, in anything in that really respect. Um, so, okay, so we just talked about the tapestry. So it's kind of funny because the first shot of the movie is a huge spoiler. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually found that first image. Um, yeah. And... Like the so the first part part of it is basically what the only thing I could remember of it, and then I knew that the rest of it was prophetic in a way, um, because the first part of it shows um, Danny kind of in distress with like a dead like a skull as the moon, and then uh, three dead bodies around her representing her family. So it was already foreshadowing the death of her family 
Um, and then the rest of it basically kind of just walks through the movie until the very end, um, to the feast. Um, so it has, so it's kind of divided into actually, uh, one, two, kind of, yeah, four, four areas. Um, and the movie kind of talks about that, that people's lives are divided, um, into four seasons and actually now looking at it, it's kind of reversed because so the person's life starts in spring yeah, uh, and then it goes to summer, then autumn, then winter. Her starts in winter. Huh. Um, and then kind of it has it has that kind of like autumn colors. Um, and then summer and then ends in spring. spring. Ends in spring. But hmm. Does that mean her life in the community will start up again in spring? And then move basically the because she is now kind of reborn in their community. Yeah, um, that is, that's such a. I mean, I always would like to imagine that these kinds of things were planted or planned by the. Oh character. yeah, I mean, they spend so much time with the story; these things arise. Yeah, you know, um, but yeah, no, like every like all the major beats of the story are here. Um, and looking at it again, uh, there has like an, a section where they're walking through a forest, which is something that they do when they go into like the actual community, and they're talking about ticks, and they make a kind of big deal about it because they're like, oh yeah, there's a huge tick um, epidemic just recently that killed a few people, and like they're, each almost each character gives like a little anecdote of a family member that was involved with like a tick, but that never comes up again. And I thought that was strange because I'm like, what do ticks have to do with anything here? I don't know if it was just something to connect all the characters or I, I, I don't know why mention ticks. <laughs> who? It, it was, um, who was Mark who in, I think initiated it. And then Pele was like, oh yeah, no, ticks are a huge problem here. And, <laughs> and then did all of the characters say, no, I don't think it was all of them, but the the majority of them had like a little anecdote like oh yeah my grandfather like has Lyme disease or something like that it was really it was really weird um and i don't i, I still can't find a connection to anything so i don't know i i definitely <laughs> plan on rewatching this yeah, movie yeah you you'll tell me <laughs> yes. so i'll i'll keep an eye out for that um but yeah um but aside from the initial tapestry and the love potion tapestry, there was other areas of the movie that foreshadowed things. Like um, when Christian was taken aside by the matriarch and there's a little picture that he sees. It's like a carving building, almost on the wall. Like a little engraving, yeah. yeah. Of a bear consumed in fire, um, which is the climax of the movie. <laughs> uh, so a little, little foreshadowings here and there of things to come. Uh, and also the picture of the bear above Danny's bed at, in her, in her house. Um, yeah, they were, they were hyping up, they were hyping up the bear quite a bit. Cause yeah. like we see the bear alive in, exactly. in a, in a cage kind of shortly after we first arrive. Mm -hmm. Um, I think even before the end of life ritual. Yeah. Before that. Um, and like, you're, you're just waiting this whole movie. Like, when's the bear going to show up again? When's exactly. the bear going to show up? And, um, yeah, they, they gut it and stuff a man inside of it. Han Solo style. <laughs> yeah. And it was, that was interesting. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that actually has parallels and real kind of, um, rituals, uh, the whole, like dropping your sins into a sacrificial animal and either the releasing it or uh, sacrificing it in some way. Um, the Israelites did a sort of say a similar ritual. So, um, the, 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 obviously the religion was very well crafted, I feel, um, and like just, just all around, it's creepy. <laughs> all right. Do you want to talk about the 
the elephant in the room. Which is... The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man. Oh, yes. So, um, just to, to get more context on maybe inspiration on the movie, we watched The Wicker Man uh, a little bit afterwards, and there definitely was inspiration taken from it. Yeah. This was Rudy's first time watching the movie. Yeah. This has been my third time watching... Or this will be my third time watching it, um, and... Honestly, like, when I was watching the movie, I remembered The Wicker Man, but it wasn't, like, a constant, like, there weren't things in the movie that were constantly reminding me of The Wicker Man. So, mm -hmm. Rudy and I have come to the conclusion that the comparison is fair because of the similar setting and certain plot beats, but I think... Midsummer has the right to exist. And I think it own. elevates the genre more than Wicker Man. I mean, Wicker Man did at its time, but I think Midsummer just takes it all the more further and just basically pushes those horror boundaries. It, where it dials it up a little exactly, more in, exactly. in, in the sex cult genre. <laughs> yes. And, and both Wicker Man and Midsummer have very interesting rituals within it that are just seen throughout the movie. Um, but definitely, I think Midsummer is more um, complete, and it feels more... It feels cleaner than Wicker Man, actually, now that I'm talking about it out loud. Really? <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know. I feel... I felt, so, I don't know. I think the Wicker Man... Like, my... So, I was a little confused during the Wicker Man about how, like, the rituals originated... Um, when maybe I just wasn't paying as, as close attention or something, but my impression was that the rituals were, um, started re recently, you cleared up, like, no, they were just continued and versus Christianity was kind of just like, uh, pushed to the side in favor of the ancient rituals. Um, but that's still like, I don't know, they, things just like kind of happen. And they're just happening uh, off screen. But in Midsummer, you know what everything is, and they're tied to one of the characters in some way, or they're ex explained. I don't know. I maybe I like being walked through some some stuff. But uh, what what was happening off screen in Wicker Man? Well, so like the the um the little so I think the first ritual we actually see explicitly was the children walking around the phallus pole the maypole yeah that <laughs> and um doing that little ritual there and then the next one is the um parthenogenesis ritual with the naked maidens jumping over the fire uh and then obviously then there's the may day ritual but um no they're just kind of just happening like they're not on a, a um because they were independent of of the may day of, of sure. captain uh, no they're independent of captain howie and we're following captain exactly so i don't know i thought how howley? howley howie howie okay yeah we're following we're following captain howdy you're right so <laughs> through <laughs> <laughs> you're right so i don't know i thought i just felt it felt cleaner in um in uh, uh, Midsummer, you're gonna make some. Yeah, you're gonna, gonna make some, some <laughs> uh, horror movie old heads really <laughs> upset. I know with that, but I don't know. It just, it just felt cleaner. Is all. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Uh, anyway, I remembered before rewatching Wicker Man because it it had been a while. I remembered them not putting as much respect into the villagers and kind of treating them like oh they're they're wacky. Yeah. They're wacky, eccentric, native yeah. thoughts, but I don't know. I think I think it 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 was rewatching it, it was more respectful to them than I thought they were than well, I remembered. Well, I being. I felt that way that they just they weren't I never got any friendly vibes from them. From well, no 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 no. Not that they were friendly, but that they were that it, uh, I I don't I'm struggling to figure out the words to put well, this, but like they weren't like they weren't exploiting. It was it didn't feel uh, ex, uh, exploitative. Okay, but um, no, like comparing it to Midsummer, like I said, like the villagers were you never really this 
Like you never really disliked them, but the villagers in Wicker Man, I never liked from the start. Like none of them, I felt you were supposed to tie yourself to emotionally. Um, oh no, you're you're not. They're and they're I don't the, know if they're the weird exactly sex cult in a sex cult horror movie. Exactly. So I, I that was a very like traditional thing to do. Like they were antagonists, and that's it. So. Uh, and I, I just – You thought there was more to the to the uh, the village commune in Midsummer. Yes. I thought it was very interesting making you honestly sympathize and kind of like, hey, that's pretty fun what they're doing. I wanted to join in that dance with the in the with the, oh my God. the May Maiden thing, like the May Queen dance. You get hopped up on – That mushroom, looks so much fun. Tea and... That looks so much fun. So um, – but no, like they were just – they were just weird at times, but at any other time, they were friendly and oh yeah, like welcome, blah blah blah. Like, but in but Wicker it didn't Man, feel it didn't feel like that artificial exactly. Like, because I've seen, I, I can't re- think of an example, but I've seen the movies where like the the villagers uh, or like some kind of like cult is like overly friendly and it feels disingenuous. Exactly. And then, then there's a turn where they're like, yeah, we're gonna do all this evil cult thing to you. Yeah. But that there was never that any that there was never that kind of turn. No. There was there was obviously they were upset when things like Mark peeing on the, well, the that's, tree, but that's understandable. Exactly. But like e- but even when they're doing like the really disturbing stuff, they're they're in such a friendly like they're so approachable and they're like they're literally stuffing a man to a, a skin bear but they're so approachable yeah they're like <laughs> it's like it's like it's you you have a you have a uh an elder figure uh, skinning the bear, but you caught that he was teaching. He's teaching. He's teaching kids. the younger generation exactly. how you do it. But that's what they would be doing, and, and that was the that that was what made it disturbing. Was like like you have no reason. Well, you do have reason you, to not you get like the them. idea that that this is going to continue as well. Yeah, for sure. That that is also true. Yeah, that that they're teaching that to their next generations, and that's just all they know. So um, there's definitely that indoctrination element in there as well. But no, but aside from that, like just – it's just so surreal and so alien that you don't directly dislike them, but you know you should because of the atrocities that they're making or they're doing. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're still, they're still approachable after doing those atrocities and – tie that to wicker man when they're doing those atrocities you hate them you like you despise them and completely sympathize with the the policeman and like i just at least i felt because i don't know i come from that background that i completely was on his side the whole movie <laughs> and i understood where he came from and I, I, that that was the more disturbing part not like just the way he went out was this was the, was the disturbing part? Like it was nothing way, else of the movie it, was disturbing. It was way more bleak. It was the way it ended in the Wicker Man. Um, I disagree. Every time I rewatch the movie, I dislike uh, the captain even more. I don't know how he, because he was so like, especially because you got the you got the understanding that. In Midsummer, they were doing that ritual for hundreds of years, and one of the characters even says it, like, this is just our way of life. Yeah. And with that in mind, having this character come into this community, even though, yeah, they do live under the United Kingdom, like, this is just their community. And he's like, you're all blasphemers, and you're going to hell, and why why don't they oh, learn wait, about wait. Jesus Christ? Wait, 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 wait. And all of that He stuff. doesn't say that they're going to hell. Uh, I don't remember him explicitly saying that. I think he probably says it to the to the. He says it definitely at the end. Well, yeah, because they're burning him in a wicker man. But, but um, but wait, 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 wait. No, he the whole repeatedly like, two people's faces tell them they're like blasphemers and heathens because they're going to murder him. <laughs> no, oh, before, before that, that, before that, when he's just investigating. Well, he says it to himself. He he does, no. He does wait, no, wait. wait. The when school is he, teacher. The school teacher, he's like, well, yeah, because she's literally talking about like a phallus 
to the to the like wait okay, wait wait like I said I understood where he was coming from. Um, he is a policeman in Christian Britain, so like I'm, I'm not saying I'm not saying that the character is bad. It's a good he's a good character, and every all the decisions he I makes understand. fit within his character. But I'm saying he feels less sympathetic okay. every time I rewatch it, especially considering how sympathetic the the cult was in midsummer and i i you also in wicker man get the implication that they have been doing this for a while and a detail that i didn't really catch um until this third viewing was that um uh, uh christopher lee's grandfather who's who came to the island and started this massive fruit harvest uh, ex- exporting business thing maintained their practices out of respect. He says he did it out of love because he he grew to. Love I think that the was more. Then. I think <laughs> we have different opinions on this, and I think it more derives on like our actual opinions on it. But I think it was more out of just hey, this is the best vehicle for me to make money, so I'm just going to use it. But no, no, but, <laughs> so, no, but Christopher Lee admits that. He says what started, yeah, no, 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 what started out as a at, at, out of uh, expediency turned into in, turned into respect and love. I don't buy it. I don't I don't buy it. You think you don't think his word can be taken truthfully? No, he is a freaking cult member who's murdering a cop. I'm not going to take his word on anything. So, I mean, I they're think, going to murder, but he but, everything but, everything that everyone tells that cop is a, almost every almost everything's a lie. So, I'm not going to take their word on anything. I think he is just riding on his dad's success who rode on the villagers' traditions to make money. And now he's just like, hey, I just get to wear drag for one day and just dance around and murder some sucker off the mainland? Sure, let's do it. But then why would he, <laughs> why would he make his family participate? Why would he raise his family on those ideas? If he didn't, at some level, wish to participate. I think I think he likes doing it, but I don't think it's out of like. I don't think he actually believes in any of it. I just think he, he thinks it's fun. That's that's really interesting, because like, I mean, he himself talks about like how God is dead and how we use the old gods to to do all this stuff. Like he doesn't believe in any of that shit. Like he is just doing it to save face and just Christopher have, Lee. Yeah, and to have fun with it. Like he. Um, is living the life. He's living the life of a, of a king. He, he's like he's like their, their their major prophet now. Like he's going to do whatever they want to just stay in that position. We are going to have to have our own episode just <laughs> yeah. on the Wicker Man. Yeah, let's just <laughs> okay, let's just okay. move on from that. We, because... Most of the stuff we've discussed so far, we have like previously talked about. This is all new to yeah, me. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, aside from that, I think we talked about it enough. Rudy, now. you're breaking my heart. <laughs> I liked it. Don't get me wrong, but I think I think we have different interpretations of the characters. Okay. All right. Uh, let's let's wrap this shit up. Okay. So recommendations. I would recommend Midsummer. Um, uh, it was a fantastic movie. Uh, I think it depends on really your how much you can stomach, <laughs> because if you're going to be disturbed, hopefully, and it's. I, I know we were reading some reviews about it and the people who I think if I personally feel that if you don't get disturbed in this movie, then you're kind of a sociopath because oh there's just, no, I'm, I'm serious because there's some really disturbing shots and like they humanize them enough that you like, you care about what's happening to them. So I don't know. I, I think it's a great movie. I'll never see it again. But, but that, you would recommend it. I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would recommend Midsummer. I think a lot of the disturbing things that were in the movie, I've seen... I don't know. I think I've seen equivalent things, but the way it was presented with the editing and the music, and the, I guess more so the sound design... Um, 
were, it was just so effective. I think if you go into it with a cynical mind or if you go into it with the presumption of, of the Wicker Man comparison, mm-hmm. I don't think you'll get as much enjoyment out of it. Um, I mean, I think both of us are, we very much get absorbed into, (laughs) especially one that is like begging, um, especially one that is like begging some kind of mystery because like the first shot of the movie is an image that we have no frame of reference for. And I immediately wanted to know what was up and how that was all going to pan out. Yeah. So, with that being said, um, God, fantastic movie. It it was. um, I I want to see what he comes up next. Oh yeah, (laughs) Uh, like this guy. Because I, I, like I said, you were surprised. I went to go watch it even after uh, how disturbed I was after Hereditary. (laughs) That's that's how good Ari is. He will give you Stockholm syndrome (laughs) for watching horrible things happen to depressed people exactly and hereditary really disturbed me i felt like i needed to pray like all night (laughs) after hereditary but i still really wanted to see how i I still wanted to see his other works like yeah um i mean so i think it takes i think it takes like I don't know. I think it takes two movies for like you to get a good idea of what a director's about, yeah. and I think he's, um, definitely I think was. I think he's definitely, if if not raise the bar, he's definitely maintained the same quality that he showed in Hereditary. Oh, definitely. definitely. Um, I don't know. I guess this was, this was like puzzling us, but. And this question came up before. What which movie? movie preferred? Yeah, which movie do you prefer? I think I said I preferred Hereditary um, because I thought that the character interactions were honestly the scarier part of the movie, and I thought that like that the was family. Just, you mean the family, family drama. drama? Yeah, like that. That was just. It's fantastic when you can make just people talking with each other. Like obviously, they weren't just talking, but just that those interactions make it scarier than the paranormal stuff that happens later. Like that is an accomplishment, and you know that really sold me on that movie. Um, and even though there was one scene in that movie that stayed with me, that wasn't like just the talking; that was the paranormal element. Um, it was still like I don't. It is still there. Are still things that stuck with me with that movie that. I don't know. It was just, it, it, it was such a, I don't know. I'm just rambling. Yeah. I remember when we first posed this question, I said I couldn't decide. And honestly, I couldn't make a fair judgment until I see yeah. hereditary, uh, sorry, Midsummer a second time. But right now I'm leaning towards hereditary just because of my experience in the theater. Like I can't remember feeling that genuinely tense during a movie in the theater. Like I, I, I really have become so jaded to like horror movies <laughs> and stuff. Like it really takes like a different like presentation to, uh, get me, uh, I guess, uh, invested. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Midsummer is still a fantastic film. I cannot wait um, for it to get shafted again at the Oscars. I have no investment with that. I, I don't watch the Oscars. <laughs> I don't know why Kirby even tries. <laughs> I wish Ari and crew the best of luck. I am very much looking forward to his next project. Me as well. Um, all right. That's right, that it. was, uh, Big, that was the first episode of Big Brain Podcast. Uh, so, all right. See you later. Fuck the Oscars. Okay, hold up. Don't go anywhere. We were editing the audio originally, and we realized there was things that we forgot to follow through on, specifically the ending of the movie and uh, more sp- and more things about the village community itself. And I'll let Rudy take it away. So something that me and Kirby disagree on is 
it's true. <laughs> is like the actual ro role the village has in everyone's fates in, in, in the, with the foreigners. So in Midsummer, um, it's pretty, I think, really well established or, or hinted at that the villagers have a fairly good idea what everyone's going to do or a rough approximation of what the, the the kids are going to be doing so they plan accordingly or they kind of manip manipulate them into situations that don't go well for them it's because just like in wicker man um uh this the sun the summer isle guy uh lord, lord summer. summer isle he he says to the cop that Basically, his whole stay there had been um, manipulated. Everything he do did, he was basically lured into that. And I think uh, Midsummer takes direct, no, maybe not direct, but in indirect or direct um, inspiration from that. Uh, everything that the kids do kind of... Like, the villagers aren't surprised by any of it. Like, for example, um, Josh, who had, before he his death, he had showed interest in the book. Um, and you can, you can assume that they have some sort of eye or security on or around the, the scripture. Yeah, you should be, you should be more specific. Like, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's their the sacred, sacred text. text. Yeah, the sacred yeah. text. Um, so you can... Uh, safely assume that they have some sort of security for it but i think that once he showed interest in it um they hey yo he's gonna probably want to snatch it overnight or at least like take pictures of it because he's explicitly asked me if he can take pictures of it so let's have a guy there with a giant hammer and smash him on the head so um and i think also with Mark, like they knew he was a pervert, so they lured him out into the woods to skin him. Um, I think they kind of manipulated events to well, well, Pele explicitly manipulated um, Danny uh, to to stay and to kind of like put a wedge between Christian and her, um, possibly to make the the seducing easier for Christian. Um, when he has his sex scene. So, <laughs> I think... That's, that's a way to describe that. I, how else would you describe it? Uh, so, um... I bleach. I, okay, yeah, that's also accurate. So, um, I think all of these elements and all of the things that happened to them um, were pretty... For like, there was forethought on, the, on part of the villagers. Because they've been doing this... For hundreds of years, they've seen all manner of people, and um, yeah, I, I, I don't see them being surprised by any, anything what anyone does. And I think having Danny as May Queen, now I may have some disagreement on this, I know I get it from Kirby, but that I, I don't think Danny as May Queen is, uh, is coincidental. I think that was, she was either um, pushed to it to some way. And she became May Queen, and that's such a crazy coincidence. I mean, they have a lot of more fit people who are like used to those drugs more so than she is. I don't know, like, so um, I think that she's gonna get a lot of privileges when it comes to like mating and who she gets with and kind of just diversifying the gene pool. Like, I think there's a lot of like. Uh, significance put on the May Queen, so her becoming one, a foreigner. You put a lot of thought into, I guess, the continuing story. Or that, they only do it every 90 years. They don't have much... I mean, their gene pool must be so stagnant. <laughs> and, the, and the only, like, um, new blood they get is from foreigners. And they explicitly talk about that. That, that, that That's part of the reason why they bring foreigners. <laughs> so... Okay. Well, gene pools aside, I think we actually agree on quite a bit about the ending. It's just only, like, minor details that we dis- Anyway, 
I think Danny becoming the May Queen was more of like Christian's fate, a poetic coincidence, not necessarily this mastermind jigsaw plot um, by the villagers to make her the May Queen. I think it was just kind of fitting um, for, for everything that the character has gone through. And it makes the story much more interesting as opposed to one of the other random village girls becoming the May Queen. Um, as far as the village manipulating people, I take a more grounded approach to it. And I, I don't think the villagers know that much about the characters to plot out each, uh, each way they take them out that far. I think they just kind of tried different things or were very opportunistic. Well, like they in... must've noticed that Mark was eyeing this girl or the girl must have noticed hey this guy is eyeing me she she could have told one of the village other villagers hey i can lure this guy because and then after he peed on the tree they're like okay yeah this guy's the fool so a, a, a phrase that comes up uh once or twice in the movie is the a idea of times. skinning the fool and mark is the fooliest of <laughs> of the crew um and I agree what you said about, like, Josh um, having eyes put on him, like, closer. Like, the, the, they were probably uh, watching him a lot closer when he asked the elder if he could take a photograph of the sacred text. And the guy was like, uh, no. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I think there's a more grounded uh, – explanation for a lot of these things or I, I i'm okay with the idea that what happens to the characters is a little more coincidental but still able to fit their character like it, it doesn't make me enjoy the story more to imagine and this is like a personal opinion but it doesn't make me enjoy the story more to think that oh they had all of their actions planned from the beginning and it it's okay that you have that interpretation, but it, it, I, I don't think it adds anything to the story. Well, okay, first off, I don't think they had all their actions planned out. I think they manipulated them into certain things. I think they have a pretty good idea of what each of them are going to do, because keep in mind, Pele has been with them for years. So, Do you think Pele has a... Like a I don't think he has a file, but I think, I think he has. It sounds like he's, like Paley has a file. No, of each, I don't each think person, that. I think... And he's like, and he faxed them to, <laughs> to the Swedish people, and they have like a wooden, uh, wooden fax machine with like no, I don't... ceremonial engravings on it. Okay, no, I don't. I don't think that. I think he he has been gathering pretty much good personality information on each of them. And um, that's why he was so excited with Danny becoming, um, coming, coming with them. I don't know, but uh, I think he, I think he was just more opportunistic. I mean, sure. So I don't was know. there? I think. A, so I was still there a, think. Was there a debriefing when Pele got to? I Sweden? think there was. I think there was a debriefing when when he get, when he finally got back to his village and hey, listen, this guy Christian, he has a terrible relationship with Danny. Mark is a complete pervert. Josh, he is here just. To, to write a paper on everything. And yeah, I think he gave a pretty good um, breakdown on each character um, to the elders and then they were able to plan accordingly. See, I think that's I think that's possible, but it it's it's not the conclusion that I came okay, to. Okay, that's fine. That's okay. fine. All right. Do All you right. want to talk about the the final yes. end like the the final ceremony yes. of the movie? So, my Walk us through it. Okay, so the final ceremony. Christian is stuffed into a skin bear and put in a, a yellow um, igloo. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and basically, um, Danny becomes the May Queen, which, so she determines uh, she determines one of the sacrifices, right? Like, she basically approves one of the sacrifices. See, this is a thing that I was struggling so to... So that was kind of a little vague, her role in it because so the the thing is they have to give nine lives to whatever god they worship um because that's never explicitly said they never explicitly said what i don't god it think was. they explicitly said a god but they just like 
to the, to, to the gods. I think it was to, or to like, their ancestors. I think it was to like Mother Earth itself. Yeah, yeah. It, so it, it's it, very it, vague that as well. Yeah, um, but I'm okay. I'm okay with. No, that. that's okay. Yeah. So, um, so they had to sacrifice nine of them. Four are foreigners. Four are of their own, and one is. Um, I guess like. Is chosen. That's right. It's chosen randomly. Yeah. So, with with oh my god. With actual lottery balls. Yes. <laughs> yes. Bing, bingo hall tumbler machine. Yeah. That was that was amazing. That is that that. Oh my god. I I think I belly laughed. Yeah. And we that. came to the conclusion that there's several ceremonies or rituals going on during this time that just happen to coincide with this day, like the death ritual, like. The, the the sexual po- the love potion ritual that just happened to coincide with this. I think what happens every time, but th- those are things that happen outside of this nine, 90 year ritual. Um, I think they saw the opportunity to exactly. just get uh, like let's let's kill several birds with Ex- one stone. Yeah, yeah. So the two old people that die in the death ceremony is one of the four. Two of the four. Oh, yeah, it's two of the four sacrificed. The other two is Pele's brother and some other random guy. But what's important, which I think is a very interesting touch, is that they're volunteers, right? Yes, they are volunteers. They volunteer beforehand. Um, and then, of course, the, f- the four foreigners who end up being Christian, Mark, Josh, and the... Um... No, no. It's, it's um, Mark, Josh, Josh. and... Um... And the, the two British, British couple, remember? They were in there too. But then who's... isn't? But I thought Christian was one of the four. No, Christian was the ninth. But they chose... So yeah, so that part is vague. We might have to see it again to under, really understand yeah, that. Th- because, the whole, because the guy that was chosen with the lottery balls is outside of the burning... So, so okay... Well, we don't know that for sure. They, 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 they burn them. Allegedly. Allegedly. They, they burn them all as the sacrifice. He wasn't there. <laughs> it, was the, it was the only two people that were living in, well, aside from Christian, in, in the burning um, yellow shed was Pe- Pe- Pele's brother and the other guy. The guy chosen through the lottery balls, he was, I know, I saw, recognize his face. He was in the crowd. So I have no idea what happened there. I don't know if... I have no idea. I have no no clue what that was for. Or All right. Well, the let's let's was. brush over. Let's yeah, let's yeah. get past the details because yeah. a lot of information was coming at us, and I was exactly. I was trying to follow everything, um, how it was shot, like yeah. what the music was doing, and follow I guess the rules of this ritual, which were kind of. Um, all like explained by the matriarch at like right before they did it. So I will have to rewatch it to get a better idea of how the ritual plays out. Yeah. But at the same time, I didn't feel necessarily like lost or it didn't take me out of the movie. I was exactly. still very much in it. I wanted to talk about more of, uh, I guess the last shots of the movie, um, and what that means for our character. Cause that was another thing that we found that we disagree on. Yeah. Um, so, I'll let Rudy explain his position. So Danny, at the very end, she is obviously super distraught. So everyone, while while the yellow building is burning, they're all in man mania. They're all dancing and jumping around and ho- hooting and hollering, <laughs> and um, hooting and hollering. And Danny is just completely distraught. She is like. Wailing. She's wailing. She has the she has the at the end of her mental fiber, and then she snaps. She just smiles and what well, she starts laughing, right? Um, I, or does she just I smile? I don't remember her laughing, but I think the final shot of the movie was her laughing. I yeah. mean, not uh, I mean not laughing, but I was her smiling. Yeah. So I think. That signified not only the weight of her awful relationship lifted and that now she's going to be accepted into this new um, uh, weird culture, <laughs> a new tribe. Um, now she has a family because they, they describe the whole village as a big family. Um, and she had, remember, she had lost hers. So she has nothing on the mainland, absolutely nothing, especially now with Christian dying. So 
her only viable option now is this village, which she can't escape anyway. And I just think her mind just broke. And she's like, this is just the easiest thing to do now for me not to just turn into a wild animal and maintain some semblance of, of humanity. So her mind just makes a complete 360 or, or 180. And you know what? This is my life now. And that's not her cautious. I, I think it's more of a mental break than a um, resolution for her. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree to some level that um, there's definitely, like, she's definitely at the end of her wits. But I think, I, I don't know, part of me feels like she's also, like, genuinely happy because I feel like not only is the burning pyramid of of her of her not really her friends but Christian's friends um kind of a symbol for the village to burn away their sins but also it's her kind of letting go of that past life and her toxic relationship with Christian burning her uh, burning away and a potential for a new start so I think there's a slightly dark and twisted but yet also somewhat optimistic tone with the end for our character because like if i remember correctly the music also kind of had an uplifting swell e even though it was after her like obviously distraught and wailing but yeah she was at the end of her wits but also there's kind of this this bittersweet tone and the the final shot of her smiling i don't know it it, it it's it's really down to the like nuances of the character's performance. Yeah, um, I I agree with you that it, yeah symbolizes that being let go from her life. But she the whole movie has been disturbed and and completely disgusted at all the the villagers' um, practices. She won't. She wouldn't think of that as a happy ending for her unless. Well, not not a happy ending. But well, you know what I mean, a, like, new, a new start. Yeah, yeah, and I think that plays a part a little bit, but I think the majority of it was her just snapping. Okay, and I mean that's kind of the beauty of that ending is yeah. that it's it, it it's open to interpretation. Yeah. Um, I don't know. That's all I wanted to Me add too. to the discussion. Did you have anything else? Nope, that was it. All right. Bye.